good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are in the world. I am Amy Hajari Case, and I would like to welcome you to the next edition of our PFF Disease Education Webinar Series. Uh, today, I'm excited to present a topic that we get a ton of questions about, and that is sleep. Um, the title of our talk today is Sleeping with PF, Exploring the Relationship Between Sleep and pulmonary fibrosis. Such a great topic. It's so important. Everybody sleeps. Um, I am joined today by uh, one of my uh, colleagues here in Atlanta, Dr. Susan Mucha. Um, uh, Dr. Mucha was born and raised in Augusta, Georgia, not far from here. And uh, she did her pulmonary critical care fellowship at Allegheny General Hospital in Pittsburgh and then did sleep medicine fellowship at Emory in Atlanta. She now works with me at Piedmont Atlanta, Piedmont Healthcare. Um, and uh, she is a pulmonary critical care and sleep medicine specialist. Um, in her clinic, she focuses on sleep disorders, including sleep apnea, restless leg syndrome, insomnia, narcolepsy, and idiopathic hypersomnia. She's just a well-rounded expert in all of these things that keep us from sleeping like we should. Um, and so I'm so excited to have her join us today and share what she knows um, about sleeping with PF. Now, before we get started, um, I would like to remind everybody uh, that uh, the information that we give here is for educational informational purposes only and is not a substitute for medical advice from your own personal physicians. Um, I would also like to do a little bit of housekeeping here before we get started. If you will look at your GoToWebinar control panel on the side of your screen, mine is on the right, you can see um, a couple of different drop down menus. Um, if you'll go to the chat menu there, you can just drop down that little arrow. You can text uh, our team here with any technical difficulties or questions that you may be, may be having, and uh, we can try to address those for you as best we can. One up from that is the handouts menu. If you would like to download a PDF copy of Dr. Mucha's slides today, uh, you can go to that handout section and download those now or later on during our session. Um, if you have questions about the material that's being presented today, uh, you can go to the questions tab, uh, just drop that down, type us questions. You can submit those all throughout the, um, our talk today. We will try to address as many of those as we can at the end of our session. So drop those in as they come to you. Um, and we would, uh, we'd love to see those come through. Um, and just as also a reminder, when we finish our uh, webinar today, we will have a survey that pops up. This will be an opportunity for you all to give us some feedback about our sessions and about future webinars. We'd love to hear from you uh, there today. All right, so without any further ado, I'd like to hand off uh, to my uh, friend and colleague, Dr. Susan Mucha. Thanks, Susie, glad to have you here. Thank you so much, Amy. I'm honored to be have been asked to cover the topic of sleep and as it relates to pulmonary fibrosis. Um, as I was saying earlier, it's certainly been sleep has been one of my favorite topics since long before I was uh, went into medicine. Um, but I wanted to put across some ideas that I'm hoping to cover today. Um, hoping that some of these may answer some outlying questions that your audience may have. And um, again, to everyone out there, thanks for having me. So I'd like to touch upon, of course, start with the importance of sleep, but then also the consequences of not enough sleep, disrupted um, insufficient sleep. Then I'll touch upon common disruptors of sleep in general, and then as it relates to PF, We'll talk also about the prevalence of sleep-related breathing disorders in pulmonary fibrosis, and more specifically about sleep apnea, the most common sleep-related breathing disorder, um, and how does sleep apnea relate or impact pulmonary fibrosis, and maybe even vice versa. But I know what many people come to our clinic for is to learn more about how can we uh, improve our sleep each night. Next slide, please. Sleep, as we know or can imagine, should be a state of restoration. Um, 
it's not quite our body and brain shutting down at night. There's actually a whole lot going on in the background while we're sleeping. But um, we know uh, that sleep is going to compri comprise a third of our life or a third of that 24-hour cycle that we have each day. So just based on that, it's pretty important, a third of our life. And the goal, we think thus far, the goal amount of sleep for adults should be somewhere around seven to nine hours of sleep. You'll often or sometimes have people who do just fine on six and a half, six hours of sleep by every way they can they can tell. Um, and then there are many patients in our clinic who can't feel like or feel like they just can't function without 10 hours of sleep. Now when, with either of those cases, the short sleeper or the long sleeper, before we can just call them a short sleeper or a long sleeper, there's a lot that we have to do um, to investigate, well, why? Why is it you only need six hours of sleep? Um, you know, talk more about what's disrupting sleep to make it so they're only getting six hours of sleep and maybe they just learned to live with it and learn to, to live with it, to tolerate it. And then also, why does this person need 10 hours of sleep? Is there something else going on at night where it's not really refreshing, restorative sleep that's happening, but disrupted sleep? So the purpose of sleep, I put a question mark because we're all still trying to figure that out. Um, it's pretty complex. Um, it's touching upon nearly all the organ systems. You name an organ system, and yes, sleep affects that. And some of the obvious things, you know, like memory consolidation or learning consolidation or, or um, the learning pathways, things like hormone regulation. Um, think about when we're sleep deprived night after night for whatever reason, um, we feel like maybe we're catching a cold easier than when we used to get good sleep. So it can affect our immune system. But the bottom line and that bottom line there on the slide is how can we reduce fatigue? Many, many of my patients just come to the clinic and say, I'm tired of being tired. Next slide, please. So a few stats about our, our uh, about sleep in the US. We have very often, in most cases, um, sleep debt. Sleep debt is what are the goal hours of sleep? for a particular or in general, a particular person or just in general, as I said, seven to nine hours. Let's say mine is eight hours. I feel good, I feel well, as long as I get my eight hours of sleep. But what amount or yeah, how many hours of sleep am I actually getting? If I'm only logging in six hours of sleep, five hours of sleep for whatever reason, maybe it's work obligations, family obligations, but I just, just can't get to the bed in time to uh, to fully obtain that eight hours, then I'm living, working with a sleep debt, two hours a night for X amount of nights. And what the studies have shown is if we have enough nights of poor, insufficient sleep, it can actually be as bad as being on, oh, so somebody driving with chronic significant sleep deprivation could be as dangerous as somebody who's driving drunk on the road. So um, that's a little bit about what sleep debt is. This um, quotation, the one in quote, uh, quotation marks, is sleep machismo is something that uh, a physician um, coined about 20 years ago or so, Dr. Seisler, when he talked about that cultural, um, well, the definition is the fact that we as Americans can often refer to sleep as a luxury rather than the non-negotiable biologic need that, that we have for it, rather than that it is. So um, his example in the um, publication he had um, earlier this uh, earlier in the 2000s was CEO, you know, these executives of large companies who pride themselves on being the first in the office at 4 a.m., last one in the office, and they and they um, essentially are setting the example for their employees that, you know, sleep can be something you do later on, you know, and you're coming here to work as long as needed. And that's a poor, you know, a bad example to set. We should uh, include sleep among those things, biological needs. Um, that sleep machismo, I think, better expressed by, and I can think of it in my own youth, in, in even training. Oh, I was 
I worked all night last night or, oh, I, I pulled an all nighter studying for this college exam and, and I feel fine. I feel great. It was fine. And, um, you know, I hardly get any sleep. I don't need, need more than X amount of hours of sleep, but it's really nothing to brag about. We finally learned it's, um, it's unfortunate that we have to go without sleep, especially on a regular basis. So the CDC reports that one in three Americans have reported not getting enough sleep on a daily basis. And over 40% uh, in this particular publication reported they've fallen asleep unintentionally in the past. Uh, sorry, in the past month, I'm missing a, a word there. That's a big deal, um, especially when we talk about all the people on the road um, who are out there. We don't need anybody falling asleep. Next slide, please. So in particular to pulmonary fibrosis, um, I found this line really summed it up. Why is sleep important in pulmonary fibrosis? Because at some point, reducing fatigue in pulmonary fibrosis in the absence of an effective treatment could become the primary therapeutic goal in our patients. Next slide, please. So, this is just uh, one of the better quotes that I found that sleep is important in any situation. Go ahead, next slide. So this slide is busier. Um, I could really just go on all day when we talk about what are the consequences of chronically disrupted sleep or even acutely disrupted sleep. I tell my patients, you know, I learned this at a young age, when, when I don't get enough sleep, when we don't get enough sleep, when I'm tired, everything hurts more. And taking it head from toe, that top part of this slide, we talk about um, emotional, our em emotional health, our mental health, um, cognitive health, all can be impacted by things that we can we recognize can occur at any day. Um, forgetfulness, poor concentration, um, poor judgment, and, and then in somebody with already cognitive impairments, that this is not helping at all. Physical impact, so taking it from here down, um, all, or I, I should say, I should have a, um, I have a great poster in my sleep clinic, and it essentially shows the entire body and and points to essentially every organ system. It Sleep deprivation is going to affect pretty much everything. Again, as I mentioned earlier, the immune system, we know that uh, chronically sleep-deprived patients have higher cardiovascular, including stroke risk. Um, diabetes risk goes up, obesity risk go up, and a, a variety of hormones are regulated by, um, um, are regulated during um, sleep. So, um, and then as far as the obesity going up, well, and, and sort of tying the weight and the hormone regulation together, we have these hormones that help us, actually help us to make those good choices or allow us to make bad food choices. And when they did studies and they sleep deprived college students, they, they presented food, healthy food over here and just junk food over here. And after uh, not several nights of sleep deprivation or poor amounts of sleep per night, those children or those uh, sorry, teenagers, um, college students, went straight to the junk food. You know, think about that in your daily life. Oh, I'm too tired to to care right now that this is so bad for me. So um, that's an easy way to make that link. But then there's, as I mentioned earlier, excessive daytime sleepiness. And in a person, you know, in an elderly person that can equate to increased fall risk. But day to day, it certainly can add to the um, motor vehicle uh, car crash um, risk. And then just at, in the workplace, you have not just low work productivity, but also depending on what sort of work you're in, you're gonna have an increased risk for work accidents. Um, our sleep clinic very often has referrals from uh, physicians who see DOT patients or pilots, or, or DOT um, personnel, I should say, or pilots, and they need to have sleep evaluated before getting uh, their card renewed for example, and that could include a sleep study or basically an evaluation by us to see if they need a sleep study. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about what is often disrupting our sleep in pulmonary fibrosis. Well, this slide I thought was a good um, general 
a picture of what's affecting anybody's sleep. Life. Let's just start with life. Next slide. So work obligations, family obligations, as a chronic lung disease patient, there's, if you just focus only on the disease and all that comes with it, that means doctor's appointments, that means medications, um, getting them straight and getting them uh, picked up at the pharmacy, you name it. I mean, just navigating through um, a life, a day of a patient with chronic disease, chronic lung disease, and, and including pulmonary fibrosis, that's stress. Um, but we found that a lot of patients with pulmonary fibrosis have sleep that's disrupted by specifically cough um, and or shortness of breath. There also can be acid reflux. That's also in general. We'll talk more about acid reflux when we speak about when I speak about sleep apnea. But acid reflux also can disrupt patient sleep and also patients with pulmonary fibrosis. What we also know about patients with pulmonary fibrosis is that their sleep architecture is completely disarrayed. So there's a lot more light sleep, a lot less deep sleep. So easily woken up during the night. Um, and that gas exchange that occurs during sleep is perhaps bad during the day anyways, perhaps um, a patient's wearing oxygen as it is, but then going to sleep um, at night, there's also increase of that hypoventilation or increase of the hypoxemia. Other disruptors that are actually fairly prevalent in pulmonary fibrosis include things like obstructive sleep apnea and restless leg syndrome. Obstructive sleep apnea we're about to get into, but restless legs is just that. I'm restless, I uh, go to bed at night, and I just got this urge to move my legs, maybe this creepy crawling sensation traveling up through my legs. It's only, it's only at night, or it's worse at night, or if, it, or if I'm in the car for too long or on an airplane, uh, you know, at rest for too long, I feel the sensation. But at night, it keeps me from sleeping um, and or wakes me up in the beginning of the night. So that's all. Those are disruptors, certainly, that are common. Next slide, please. So focusing a little bit on obstructive sleep apnea, um, I thought I had a slide here that had a nice picture of what's happening. Oh, there we go. Okay, that'll work. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I'll go back in a second. But uh, looking down at that diagram, what we're seeing is um, that anatomy of the upper airway. As we're sleeping, there's airflow going through our nose and or our mouth. And um, with obstructive sleep apnea, that airway, upper airway, is is blocked. It's blocked by usual culprit is the tongue, whether it's because the patient has a large tongue or maybe the tongue just sits up high um, or and or maybe just those muscles relax more than the next person who's asleep. And you know, a lot of these things can be inherited, but as um, patients gain weight, then the tissues of the upper airway can swell and now we have an increased risk for obstructive sleep apnea which is one reason why this is uh, the prevalence of OSA is going up in America, um, simply if we uh, relate it to the obesity uh, that, are, that we have in America. But with those obstructions, what's happening is we're of course blocking some of that oxygen that's trying to get by. And whether it's a complete blockage or a partial blockage, these register on a sleep study as an obstructive apnea event. Um, and or what also we register as an event is if this obstruction occurs, but the airway opens up, perhaps the brain's waking the body up, hey, take this breath, I'm not getting what I need. And so the, the on a sleep study, sorry, on a, on a sleep study, this registers as an arousal. The patient has this brief wake up. Well, what am I doing awake? Well, what's happening during that obstruction is when the oxygen levels go down, even if it's relatively, the brain recognizes this as a problem. And so it sends our fight or flight response hormone, uh, hormones, one of them being adrenaline, racing through the body. Now the heart rate's going up, the blood pressure's going up, all these other hormones are being released and in some cases you're getting more fluid sent to the bladder. The brain says, hey, I'm not getting enough air, I need you to 
take a deep breath, wake up and take a proper breath. That's when you wake up. What am I doing awake? Why is my heart racing? Why do I feel anxious or scared? Uh, why do I have to go to the bathroom? And the next day waking up like I didn't even really get to sleep last night. And that's obstructive sleep apnea. Next slide, please. Oh, backing up if you could, please, Amy. Um, forward one. Yes, that one. Thank you. So how does sleep apnea present? I already described some of the things that patients may feel at night when they have sleep apnea, but how about during the daytime? How is it affecting us? Um, again, bringing you back to fatigue, patients presenting just with fatigue or daytime drowsiness, some falling asleep in, um, at the movies or I'm falling asleep in church, or if I, as long as I'm not active, I'm falling asleep. Um, the waking or waking up with headaches is a common complaint that we hear, or very dry mouth, waking up irritable. I'm always waking up on the wrong side of the bed, um, or being forgetful and and having poor concentration during the day is something that you know I have patients in their 40s and 50s, and they say I, I blame it on my age. <laughs> You're only 40 or 50, so maybe there's something else going on. And let's do some testing. Um, other people witnessing the patient sleeping, so our bed partners or family members may um, urge us to see the sleep specialist because the snoring's gotten out of hand, or they've witnessed the breathing pauses at night and they're scared. Um, gasping, choking, coughing during sleep as well is uh, a common complaint or presentation. If you could go to the next slide, please, Dr. Case. And so some epidemiology. Obstructive sleep apnea out of the other sleep disordered breathing or sleep disordered breathing disorder, sleep apnea will be the most common. Um, the most common complaint, though, in the sleep clinic is insomnia, and I'll get more into that um, when I speak uh, more about women in sleep. But um, in general, uh, through the studies, we found that at least mild sleep apnea has been seen or to have a prevalency in women anywhere from 6 to 19%. And in women, it's uh, in men, it's more, all the way up to as high as 30%, 25%. Once we get to the 65 and over population, that risk is 84%. So it goes up as we get older. And some of that is related to the, the muscles of, of the upper airway becoming a little more lax as we get older. Um, May, and some of that may be related to weight gain as life goes on. When we talk about the prevalence of moderate to severe degrees of obstructive sleep apnea, that can reach 49% in the 65 and older crowd, but up to 17% uh, in general in adults. And then there was a publication a few years ago that surmised that worldwide there's probably a prevalence of 1 billion people um, walking around with sleep apnea. Next slide, please. This is just a diagram. I've already hit upon these topics, uh, just all the different things that can be affected by poor sleep and in particular sleep apnea. So increased insulin resistance, they've actually found that blood sugar control in the non-diabetic, or I should say the pre-diabetic, can be more impacted by sleep apnea, um, though the diabetic's blood sugar control is impacted as well. Increased traffic and workplace accidents, um, lack of sex drive, um, cardiac problems. We have seen um, patients with abnormal heart rhythms like atrial fibrillation. Um, patients with congestive heart failure are often coming to our sleep clinic because that's part of the um, optimization of heart health and is ruling out and, treat, and or treating sleep apnea. Stroke risk goes up. That ability to control the blood pressure can be affected by uncontrolled sleep apnea, probably related to that surge of adrenaline occurring during the night. It starts to change our whole cardiovascular system and can make blood pressure control a problem. And it's often one of the things that brings some of my younger patients into the sleep clinic because their primary care provider has uh, recently started them on a blood pressure medicine. And between the two of them, they felt like we need to see what else is going on during sleep. Next slide, please. So what about obstructive sleep apnea and pulmonary fibrosis? I would say a blanket statement uh, would be correct of there really are not an, enough studies out there. Um, over the last several years, those studies have started to come through, 
but um, what we have found is that there is a high prevalence of obstructive sleep apnea in, and more particularly, the studies have been in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Um, but there's been, uh, there was a meta-analysis that was um, in our Journal of Clinical Medicine back in 2020, where they looked at a number of um, liter uh, literature or reports up until that point and out of about 500 abstracts, they were able to pull only 18 studies that fulfilled what they were looking for as far as were the patients all tested properly um, and did they meet certain criteria that we all can agree equals sleep apnea. And out of those 600 plus IPF patients, 76% had sleep apnea. That's actually strong, or, uh, as, I, as you can see from the slides previous, that's going to be greater than the um, prevalence of sleep apnea in the general population. So what they also found in some of the um, literature out there was that the questionnaires that we often use in our sleep clinic and perhaps even the primary care provider's office, things like the Epworth sleepiness score, where it's a list of questions um, trying to gauge how sleepy is my patient, if you're in this situation, if you're driving a car, if you're just along for the ride in a car, um, if you just had lunch and um, you were able to sit for a while in any of these circumstances, how likely is it for you to doze off? And what they found in looking at some of these um, articles was that those scales, those surveys that we have patients fill out regarding their, their sleepiness or fatigue didn't really correlate, um, underestimated the amount of patients that had sleep apnea once they got these patients into the sleep lab. Next slide, please. So, how does or how could um, obstructive sleep apnea possibly contribute to pulmonary fibrosis? There are some theories out there and uh, they've landed with this intermittent hypoxia. So as that airway is obstructed and the oxygen is obstructed, then we have, of course, oxygen desaturations. But perhaps during that arousal, when the brain gets the body to at least partially wake up to take a full breath again, there's the reoxygenation. And that desaturation and reoxygenation is referred to as intermittent hypoxia. And it has been found, or um, from the lit review that I did previously, that this intermittent hypoxia can be worse than that chronic hypoxia that a lot of our chronic lung disease patients live with. And the theory, again, what they found was uh, free radicals, start, the inter, intermittent hypoxia generates more free radicals, oxidative stress, leading to more inflammation um, affecting the vascular endothelial tissue, um, including that of the vascular endothelial tissue. So this um, suggests, and more specifically are uh, shown better in animal studies, a direct relationship between that sleep apnea related prolonged intermittent hypoxia um, and in the, uh, in the progress or directly related to the progression of pulmonary fibrosis. I put question marks over these next points because we're still trying to figure this out. But with obstructive sleep apnea, imagine somebody, maybe a bed partner, or maybe you've been told you do this, but imagine somebody who's sleeping and you can see them struggling, trying to get this airflow to happen, but it's not happening or it takes a while before it finally happens. That struggle is actually affecting the pressures within our chest wall. And when we do that, we have a higher risk of essentially pulling that stomach acid north. And so now we are waking up with um, the feelings of reflux, or maybe we're waking up coughing, and that's just related to the sleep apnea. But if there's any chance that we're aspirating this, inhaling that stomach acid, then you, you can imagine there, the relationship that could exist between this and further, uh, further lung damage. With sleep apnea, there is a good prevalence um, of pulmonary hypertension, elevated pressures of the right side of the heart. And um, it can be worse in, uh, it can be both in obstructive sleep apnea or obesity hypoventilation syndrome, where some of the hypoxemia that we see during these sleep studies is, can be pretty dramatic. And so um, we know that the, the 
prevalence exists or the relationship exists between sleep apnea and pulmonary hypertension, we know that there often can be there is a relationship between pulmonary fibrosis, chronic lung disease, uh, but but also specifically pulmonary fibrosis and pulm and pulmonary hypertension. So um, the sleep apnea itself may also be um, directly or indirectly increasing the PF patient's risk for pulmonary hypertension. Next slide, please. Well, how about the flip side of this? How could pulmonary fibrosis possibly contribute to obstructive sleep apnea? Well, in somebody with restrictive um, ven ventilatory impairment um, in the patient in the pulmonary, uh, with pulmonary fibrosis, we can have decreased lung volumes, which in turn affects the upper airway stability and increases that risk of collapse, of the upper airway collapse that I described when I described obstructive sleep apnea. And in particularly during certain stages of our sleep, one of our sleep stages is known as REM sleep. During REM sleep, almost all of our muscles are paralyzed. And the main breathing muscle, not the only, but the main breathing muscle is our diaphragm and it still works during REM sleep, but all the other muscles um, are supposed to be fairly immobile, fairly paralyzed. Um, we do most of our dreaming during REM sleep. So whoever designed this, who designed our bodies, didn't felt like it, uh, probably felt like it would not be a good idea for um, all of our muscles to be able to move during our dream states because acting out our dreams could be dangerous. So that's, we think, where that may have came, come from. But during REM sleep, when those muscles relax even more, and that includes you know, those chest wall muscles and the upper airway muscles, our sleep apnea can get worse. That means our hypoxemia can get worse. And so that's what is meant by the worsening during REM sleep. Next slide, please. So let's talk about treatment. Let's talk about CPAP for sleep apnea. And in particular, um, what about CPAP in the pulmonary fibrosis patient? So from this diagram, you can see that CPAP, continuous positive airway pressure, is um, uh, pressurized air being pushed through a mask of the patient's choice. This uh, patient here in the diagram is wearing a nasal mask, so it covers just the, uh, the nose. There are masks out there that cover the nose and the mouth, and there, na there are masks that just sit at the nostrils, sort of like prongs, nasal prongs of a nasal cannula. And what's happening is we're pushing that air through the upper airway, essentially stenting that airway open. So the patient's guaranteed to get the air, the oxygen within the air, no matter what. And with the removal, essentially the removal of the obstruction, then immediately the snoring goes away because that's what that sound is, is that friction of those tissues. Um, immediate, or in general, we should have more consolidated sleep, not such fragmented sleep, which in a patient with PF that, that we have found often has fragmented sleep could make a significant difference. Next slide, please. So regarding sleep apnea in a patient with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, what do we know? Again, not a whole lot out there until recently, but what we did learn is that what we know in general about CPAP is it's going to decrease that intermittent desaturation or that intermittent uh, hypoxia I spoke of. Just by removing that obstruction with the CPAP or the air that, that's in it, we have open airway, open uh, or, or, or pathway primed for the delivery of oxygen to all of our tissues. So we know that in general, but when they looked at studies with pulmonary, fibr pulmonary fibrosis patients or IPF patients um, treated with CPAP, they did find it can improve the activities of daily living and the quality of life. There's that fatigue component that I mentioned earlier. So can we reduce some of the fatigue that comes along with pulmonary fibrosis? It's possible that the C, that CPAP can reduce the pulmonary hypertension uh, correlated with obstructive sleep apnea and potentially that in the OSA IPF patient as well. 
And there's not a lot of prospective data thus far, but there is data that shows that good CPAP adherence, which is key, and that's key in any patient who's uh, been prescribed CPAP, but a patient that's using CPAP has gotten through all the, you know, potential obstacles, finding the right mask fit, et cetera, finding the perfect pressures. This is what your sleep doctor or specialist uh, helps you with. Once those uh, obstacles have been overcome, they found, and the patient's wearing it enough, you know, several hours during the night, that it can increase the survival in IPF. Next slide, please. So, sleep apnea or not, in general, how can we improve our sleep? So I thought I would just list a few things here on the next couple of slides regarding sleep hygiene, um, recommendations for making tonight's sleep better and in, in all the nights thereafter. So the importance of maintaining the same bedtime, or I should say just a strict sleep schedule, same bedtime, same wake up time, that also means, or that includes on the weekends, which can be hard after having a week where we're where we're accumulating sleep debt, how can we not sleep in on the weekend? But what the studies are showing us is that a more regular bedtime wake up time is better for us in the, in the long run. I list exercise, whatever that means. If it means um, just a walk up, uh, up and down the block, a walk back and forth in the living room, whatever exercise is for you, we know that, that moving more and getting some form of exercise each day is, go, is helpful for sleep in general. Strategic napping. So what I mean by strategic napping is naps definitely can help, can help reduce that daytime fatigue, daytime sleepiness, but it's important we do it at the right time and for the right duration. So taking a 15 to 30 minute nap is actually perfect. You're not sleeping too long where you're going into several cy different cycles um, or multiple cycles of your sleep. That means you're waking up feeling more refreshed. In comparison to somebody who's taking a two hour nap, then they may wake up and feel sluggish, like they just didn't get any benefit from that nap at all. But the other thing a long nap can contribute to is actually insomnia. So both a long nap and a nap taken too late in the afternoon can contribute to any difficulty we may have falling asleep at night. And what that's based on is as we wake up, as we start the day, once, our, once we're woken up, we have a um, push in, inside ourselves to, or this drive to sleep. And it starts out here and it starts to rise as the day goes on so that when bedtime comes, we lie down, we go to sleep, and we relieve that, um, that pressure. But if we're taking naps that are too long or naps that are too late in the day, we relieve, let's call this, let's see, <laughs> sorry, let's call this bedtime, and this is the morning, and here's our sleep pressure. We take a nap in the afternoon, and now we relieve that pressure. But suddenly it's, it's bedtime, and... No, the brain, the body feels like, well, no, we don't need to sleep. We just, we just relieved that pressure valve earlier today. We're good for a while. So that, that's one reason to keep the naps short earlier in the afternoon rather than later. Some things that we, I know we've heard a lot about um, in general is avoiding eating close to bedtime. We think maybe three hours at least between bedtime or between our dinner or last meal and bedtime. Avoiding caffeine is important. As you can imagine, it can last in our system for quite a while. So we usually ask our patients to really try to cut the caffeine off at least six hours before bedtime. Smoking actually, or the nicotine within, can be a stimulant. So um, I really see only sleep patients at this point. Well, some of my sleep patients, I think, smoke. But when we talk about uh, plans for trying to quit smoking, I, I at least, I ask, at least let's start with cutting out the evening smoking, the evening cigarette, and see if we can get you some better sleep as we try to get you, you know, to, to quit overall in the long run. Alcohol near bedtime, 
I know a lot of patients present to us saying, you know, I need to have a couple glasses of wine or I'm not going to sleep. And it may feel like a good fix. I have a, a former colleague who used to say, a nightcap comes with a price. Because it can, it can, as it metabolizes in our body, actually wake us up more often during the night. And as far as patients with a lifetime of chronic heavy alcohol use, sleep problems can be a problem um, related to as they're actively drinking and then even later in life, even if they've, uh, they're in recovery and no longer drinking. So the best plan or best recommendation is to try to uh, not rely on or start backing off on any nighttime alcohol. Um, going back to sleep apnea, alcohol can make our sleep apnea worse because it's relaxing those muscles of the upper airway more than they were if you had not had alcohol in your bedtime. And it's also adding a little bit of water, a little bit of edema to those tissues as well. So I have patients uh, who present with, well, I only snore on the weekends, my wife tells me. Well, what's going on on the weekends? What, what are y'all doing? <laughs> um, so next slide, please. I like to talk about setting the stage for good sleep. Set yourself up for success. Make sure the bedroom environment is ideal for sleeping. You want a cool room, a dark room, and not a lot of clutter. Um, you know, some of those shows uh, where they talk about um, the feng shui or feng shui, I don't know how to pronounce it, of, of everything. And one of those things that they will actually mention is keeping the bedroom at like a haven and not having your work, your laptop, or anything else that might cause stress around in your bed, in your bedroom or, or in your bed. So that brings me to the next uh, topic, which is trying to let go of the day's obligations before bed. You know, one of the things that we found with the pandemic is when we were all, um, when people were hunkered down at home, is that we started working at home and that meant, oh, look, we no longer had to drive in for an hour. Our boss now has access to us an hour before we used to arrive. So, you know, we're receiving emails before the workday starts and after the workday is ended. So it's really important to turn the electronics off. Um, the, the all the screens, whether it's TV, our phone, one last look at social media before bedtime or one last email check, all of these things are coming with that blue light that is emitted from that screen. And that blue light can act as, it can act like a stimulant is how I, is how I tell my patients. So trying to cut those things or turn those things off at least an hour or two hours before bed is really important in trying to get that, set that stage for good sleep. Um, one thing I, I tell my patients is, you know, when it comes to setting up that, setting the stage is developing good bedtime rituals. So when we're babies, when we're infants, we really had it made. Somebody uh, at nighttime, at bedtime, someone bathed us, they fed us, they swallow, swaddled us into comfortable blankets or wraps and dimmed the lights and sang us to sleep or, you know, made it just this perfect environment for sleep. And somewhere along the way in life that all fell apart and we need to find a way to get back into that or um, maybe consider that bedtime, that bedroom, a spa day. I mean, dim the lights, you know, soft music and really focus on getting everything out, um, out of your bedroom that shouldn't be there. So mindfulness, meditation, reading, um, these are all good things, great things to do um, uh, while you're climbing, uh, after climbing into bed, taking a warm bath or shower as you're um, getting ready for bed, wash the day away, that can help you sleep better. I tell people my mom uh, knew best, she said, take a shower. I would always struggle to put off taking my nighttime shower as a child. And she say, take your shower, you'll sleep better. And she was absolutely right. Next slide, please. So what are my takeaways? Hopefully after you leave this uh, presentation, you'll agree. If, that, if you haven't already, sleep is important. 
and not just the duration of sleep, but the quality of sleep. Duration, we feel probably seven to nine hours is best for most adults, but it's okay. Some people do okay just outside that range, or some people need um, further evaluation as to why they're outside that range. But some common sleep disruptors seem to be more common in pulmonary fibrosis, and those include obstructive, uh, those include obstructive sleep apnea and restless legs. So if you feel like you have disruptors happening snoring or waking up a lot during the night or getting up to go to the bathroom or just the sensation in your legs that drives you crazy at night, speak to your doctor and see if a sleep medicine evaluation should be next. Next slide. And believe lastly, sleep disruptors can be mitigated. These can be improved, reduced, maybe eliminated. Um, so again, talk with your doctor if you have any of the, the things that I described, um, including the snoring, gasping, coughing during sleep, or just general fatigue, um, or difficulty not just falling asleep, but difficulty staying asleep. Next. And that's all. So I'd love to hear what sort of questions y'all have. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mucha. That was a really, really great overview and a lot of um, a lot of information. I I certainly learned a few things. So um, <laughs> I, I thank you for that. We have a lot of questions, so I'm just going to dive in. Um, we've got some really great, thoughtful questions here. I'm going to start with a few about um, oxygen and a couple about CPAP. Um, we have some folks asking about whether oxygen, like continuous flow oxygen at night, say through a concentrator, is any kind of substitute for CPAP. And I think it's come that there are two parts to that question. Um, if I, I suppose one instance in somebody who's been diagnosed with sleep apnea versus someone who has not been diagnosed with sleep apnea. I think that's a really great question. It does come up a lot. Um, a lot of times we'll have patients who are in the hospital for um, acute on chronic lung disease and um, we'll eventually see them in the sleep clinic and they will ask the same thing. Well, I use oxygen at night. If you think I have sleep apnea, aren't I treating it? And the, the short answer is no, we're not treating the obstructions. We're not treating uh, you know, obstructive sleep apnea. Certainly, we're treating the hypoxemia, and a patient with chronic lung disease may already have hypoxemia even outside of obstructive events. So it's probably, it, it may not be the wrong treatment that patients coming out of the hospital having had an um, exacerbation of um, PF or um, COPD, and they're still requiring oxygen at night, which was either new or not new. Maybe they already were wearing um, oxygen at night just based on their treatment plan in the clinic. But I would say in briefly not treating obstructive sleep apnea, oxygen, supplemental oxygen is not treating the obstructive sleep apnea. It may be treating the hypoxemia related to that chronic lung disease. And it's not a bad thing that the patient is using the oxygen that was prescribed. Um, we have further work to do. We should study them and see uh, in the lab where we can see We'll actually have patients in the lab who are on oxygen, and we have a protocol where we actually remove the oxygen. The technicians there are excellent, excellent and uh, well-trained, and they, they know the protocol, and they know we'll start without oxygen. And if this patient is still hypoxemic, even before we've gotten to any obstructive apneas, we may go ahead and start the oxygen again, but then once we hit the obstructions, we can see how those uh, uh, oxygen levels dip even further. And so I think the short answer is not treating OSA, but probably not the wrong move because we're treating lung disease that warranted um, the O2 supplementation to begin with. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a great explanation. I think there, I mean, there's a point to be made there, right? That some patients actually need both, right? They need the PAP therapy to 
uh, overcome the obstructions and the extra oxygen just to overcome an, an additional oxygen deficit from their pulmonary fibrosis. So there may be a role, and I think that's where a sleep medicine specialist can be so helpful is in helping determine, you know, what or you know which of those therapies or both um, is most important for um, for the patient. I have another question. Um, Can I add one more thing to that one is, as you're saying, like in the lab, in the sleep lab, we have the luxury of being able to try different devices, some more advanced devices like BiPAP, bi-level PAP therapy, sometimes even with, sometimes with the addition or the switch over to the bi-level therapy, sometimes we're able to get or eliminate the oxygen supplementation. So yeah, there's a wide range of, um, methods to treat the sleep disordered breathing kind of lumping it all together and so yeah there's there's lots of bells and whistles out there that we have in the sleep lab that can try to get the patient the best device needed fantastic well so you just actually led into my next question and that is um the difference between apap and bipap and cpap and i guess my question about this uh to add on to that is sort of a secondary question would you use the term cpap in your presentation is that interchangeable if it's a different type of PAP therapy that, you know, potentially for our, our listeners here was prescribed to them by their doctor for their condition? I think that's a great question. Um, I often in my documentation will call things PAP therapy for that reason. So we, we have APAP, BPAP, and CPAP, but it's, uh, it's all PAP therapy, positive airway pressure, um, therapy. APAP stands for, so backing up, starting with C, CPAP, if I have somebody on a CPAP device, then let's, for example, say I'm giving them a pressure of 10 centimeters of water pressure when they inhale and 10 uh, when they exhale. So it's essentially stenting that airway open. What APAP is, it's auto titratable CPAP. So it takes the guesswork out of um, what pressure is best for this particular patient. And uh, what we found is it is I mean, we typically start with APAP. We will start with auto CPAP and patients who are very simple, not on oxygen. We did maybe a home sleep test and they were, even if they were severe sleep apnea, but their oxygen levels didn't dip too badly, we'll just, hey, let's get this ball rolling right now. We'll order an auto CPAP. And then that auto CPAP is set with a pressure range that the doctor um, or provider will set between let's say you know five and 20 centimeters of water pressure and then that device is going to figure out moment to moment how much obstruction is there and if it needs to ramp up the pressure say when you flip onto your back and your apnea gets worse or you go into a deeper sleep like REM sleep where things can get worse it'll ramp up that pressure accordingly and then when we see them in the clinic we can do a download say oh well here's your range but here's where you live and sometimes we'll narrow it just because sometimes the high pressure might briefly wake them up and so we'll play around tweak things in the clinic but um, it's a great first start if there's no chronic hypoxemia in the picture so if patients are on oxygen that's when we need that titration in the sleep lab so we can see what best to how best to treat bi-level pap is when we have one pressure when we when the patient inhales and another pressure is delivered when they exhale so imagine a pressure when you inhale of 10, just like uh, the CPAP setting was. So 10 uh, centimeters of water pressure was to open up that airway. And then let's say six centimeters of water pressure, a lower pressure is being delivered on exhalation, which number one may actually feel more comfortable because we're not fighting as hard to get that breath out. So you may see sleep specialists per, uh, ordering a bi-level PAP device when their patient has become very intolerant of CPAP. It's just they're fighting too hard to get the breath out. So bi-level, one indication for switching to bi-level is, um, is, is to help that patient who's uh, had a hard time tolerating it. There are a lot of other uh, fancy devices, um, especially for chronic lung disease patients called AVAPs and IVAPs. And that's where we guarantee a certain tidal volumes delivered in this patient and often um, can be the most beneficial device, but it needs, we need a test in the lab to get there. There's lots out there. Sorry, I muted. It's a little loud in my neighborhood today. 
Um, but uh, I think that's a really great explanation. And I just personally am always really surprised uh, and pleasantly surprised at how smart these machines are and how much feedback they can, um, you know, they can take into account and make adjustments and then how much information a sleep specialist can get out of a PAP machine about what's going on at night. So I think that's just a really cool ability to monitor people and how they're, how they're responding to therapy. I, I'm sure you find it very useful in managing your patients. It's become a lot easier. And patients also can see how well they slept. You know, we like to have that feedback right away. How did I sleep last night? Checking Fitbits, et cetera. Well, when they're set up with one of these PAP devices, they often will have access to how well they did as far as how well their apneas were controlled. Absolutely. Okay, so I'm going to switch gears. We still have more questions about CPAP and things like that, but I am going to try and get to some of these other areas in the last couple of minutes we have left. One um, has to do with some of that sleep environment. Um, and uh, I have heard you talk about this before, but um, what about white noise or music at night? Excuse me. I know you've talked about sort of having like that, a droning uh, book read or something in the background with the Calm app um, before. I've heard you talk about that. So can you talk about sort of like the utility of, of a, a white noise or something like that, a fan for perhaps at night? I think a lot of it is patient dependent. You know, when it comes to exercise, what I didn't talk about was the timing of that. And a lot of patients, if they're exercising in the evening, they're gonna lie in the bed awake for a couple of hours because it just ramps up the system too much. But some patients are just fine. And they say, oh yeah, I take a nice walk right after dinner and I go to bed, you know, three hours later and I fall asleep with no problem. So I think along the same lines when it comes to white noise or, or things that we feel relax us, it's, it's what works for you. Um, you know, the, the, as far as having the dark room, they're act, they've actually done studies where the eyeball can detect light through the eyelid, and, as you can imagine, because you probably noticed it, if the lights, if it's too bright in the room, and, and then our brain's seeing that, and light is a real big, one of the stronger stimuli for letting our brain and body know it's time to look alive. And so um, having an eye mask or blackout curtains, I think it's cheaper to get an eye mask, can be really helpful because you're really telling the brain it's it's time to sleep. But I like apps like, um, as you mentioned, the Calm app. They have a lot, they have a variety of sleep stories. And I was um, the one I was mentioning the other day was one about the sport of cricket and everything about cricket. And as I said that day, I don't know how it ended and I never will know how it ended. Like I, I, I don't care what happened at the end. <laughs> um, and it's read by a, a gentleman with a monotonous voice and just sort of lulls you to sleep. So I think my answer in general would be whatever works for you. Um, a lot of people come and say, I have to watch TV. It's the only way I can go to sleep at night. Um, well, at least put a timer on it. You know, even our ears need a break. So even if we're just listening to the TV, I want, it would be nice to have it turn off at some point and really rest the brain as much as possible. Absolutely. Yeah. Everybody in my house got really acclimated to white noise when we had babies in the house. And now it is, it's really like this association, like mm -hmm. for me, especially I hear white noise on an airplane or in a car and I'm just like, Ooh, <laughs> um, okay. So, uh, we are actually at time and we have so many questions. I'm sorry. We couldn't get to more of them. They were really great. And, um, Dr. Mitch, I may actually follow up with you on some of them so that we can uh, get back to some of these people with great questions before we, um, sign off for the day. I wanted to, um, just uh, remind everybody in the last couple of minutes we have here that if you want to download these handouts, uh, you can go to the handouts tab in your GoToWebinar control panel uh, and download those uh, quickly. They are PDF, so it shouldn't take but a minute just to click on that and download them. This uh, is uh, has been recorded and will be on our YouTube page uh, probably in a couple of weeks. So we'll, um, we'll make sure that that goes there so you can watch it later and review. And uh, 
Also a reminder, if we have our, we have our survey that will pop up after uh, we log off here for your feedback. I also want to just give a little teaser for our next webinar. Uh, September is Pulmonary Fibrosis Awareness Month, and so we have lots of activities coming up for PFAM on social media and some exciting things, uh, surprises for you, but we will be having a webinar uh, September 13th. This is um, our annual ILD Day webinar with our partners that you see at the bottom here. We're going to have a great discussion about oxygen, why we need it, how to supplement it, those types of things. Um, really relevant to so many people. And I think um, based on the questions that there's some folks here that would have um, interest in that as well. So please uh, give us a look and come back and join us then. Finally, I'll thank our sponsors for today and, uh, and most gratefully thank uh, Dr. Mucha. Susie, thank you so much for joining us for all this great information that you've brought to our, our, community and our community and our audience today. And thank you also on a personal level for helping me take care of my patients in the clinic because we definitely share. Thank you so time. much for trusting me with your patients. I'm enjoying meeting them and taking care of them. Thank you all for, ha for having me and, and thanks so much, Amy, for asking me to speak. It's, my pleasure to be able to spread the word about sleep as much as I can. Thanks so much. Everybody have a great day and we'll see you next time.